Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for August 1st, 2022. This is the time of week that we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim, and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted in the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Uh, this meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m. Pacific time, except when that coincides with a US holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar that you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. Uh, this calendar will contain the dates of all the meetings, especially the ones that do end up changing. Uh, we'll send out notifications of the upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive those notifications, uh, ask us to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. There's a notes doc that accompanies the meeting and recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts that interest you the most. The meeting tends to run about 30 to 90 minutes, uh, again, depending on how many people we have. So this gives you the opportunity to skip around. After each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's notes document on the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc, uh, and you can add your notes for the following meeting. Uh, and you can do that throughout the week as well. Those go up uh, typically within a day or so after the meeting occurs. So you can actually put those in throughout the week if you like. Uh, if you wish to participate but you cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read uh, aloud for you during the meeting. The meeting is going to be held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of the Python on hardware, uh, excuse me, the Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at how the project is going by the numbers, uh, separate from what we're all up to. The third part is uh, the hug reports section. This is an opportunity to highlight the good things that folks are doing, take time to recognize the awesome folks in our community and beyond. Uh, the fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what you've been working on. Take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last week and what you'll be doing uh, you know, in the next week until the next meeting. And then the fifth and final part is in the weeds, and this is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These can come out of status updates or be identified ahead of time as too long, <coughs> uh, and that covers how the meeting will go. Um, I did not catch maybe Scott. I think maybe you're unmuted. I didn't catch actually who it was that coughed, but... Um, let me see here. Okay, so yeah, that's how the meeting will go. Uh, with that, we will do uh, community news next. So let me start taking timestamps and get to our community news here. Uh, let's go there. Timestamp. Okay, first item in community news is a new milestone for the CircuitPython project. So we reached 300 Adafruit CircuitPython libraries recently. Uh, this is a major milestone. Adafruit has now written 300 Adafruit uh, libraries, CircuitPython libraries, um, interfacing to CircuitPython with, and these cover drivers, uh, helper functions, and more. Um, just a, a reminder to everyone, you know, Adafruit invests time and money into providing free open source code to help you use the Adafruit's products and much more um, in the hope that you will buy some project gear from Adafruit so you can support the efforts of developing libraries and more by purchasing hardware uh, from Adafruit.com. And there is a link here to the Adafruit blog, which does contain a couple of additional details if you want to check it out. Next up is uh, from the GitHub blog. Uh, this was a notice that the uh, GitHub sponsors program is expanding, uh, bringing the total number of uh, regions covered to 68. So um, they are continually, uh, continually branching out, adding more and more regions to this program, which is great. This is a, for those that don't know, GitHub Sponsors is a way uh, for open source projects and developers to receive uh, funding and support through GitHub. So uh, even like uh, the MicroPython project and many of the CircuitPython developers um, are available to be sponsored through Discord. So it's great to see that coming to more and more regions all the time. 
Uh, next up is the Pi Ohio talks, uh, including a talk by our very own Katni. Uh, Pi Ohio 2022 had some great talks last week. Uh, Katni's was called Simplicity and Fun Learning with CircuitPython. Um, you can find the video of Katni's talk on uh, the YouTube link here. There's also a Twitter link as well, and uh, one additional YouTube link which contains the entire playlist of all of the Pi Ohio talks, uh, if anyone is interested in watching those. Um, next up, we have a couple of interesting projects for the week. Um, the first one is from Geek Mom Projects. Um, this one is documented with a link on Twitter, and this was a very neat, uh, colorful LED headband uh, with some nice LED animations running on that. So that was super cool. And the other one which I've uh, grabbed here that I thought was really neat was uh, a project using the Adafruit Matrix Portal uh, as sort of a display to show live blood sugar data from a Bluetooth enabled uh, blood sugar monitoring system. So it would pull the data from this little patch on the user's arm, send it to the phone, the phone would send it to the server, and then the matrix portal uh, was able to pull that data out of the server using some API and show it on the display. Um, an honorable mention for this one I saw in the video for this project, this person also hooked up their terminal prompt uh, to show their blood sugar, which I thought was a, a really neat idea for a developer trying to get some information to stay in front of their uh, face and on the tip of their brain. So um, really neat stuff there. Check out the links for both Twitter and TikTok for that project. Um, so that wraps up the community news. So with that, I will finish up by mentioning that uh, this, all of these items and many more come from the CircuitPython weekly newsletter, which is a CircuitPython community run newsletter that is emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com. Uh, it highlights the latest Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Uh, to contribute your own news or projects, you can uh, edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with those changes. Uh, or if you uh, are not as familiar with GitHub, you can also just tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email to cpnews at adafruit.com in order to submit those newsletter ideas. So next up, we will have the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. I will read the overall section here. Let's get some timestamps in. So overall this week, uh, across the entire project, we had 42 pull requests merged by 20 authors, uh, which is uh, really nice to see. A couple of names which I do not recognize, and these might be newer folks or uh, less frequent contributors, or perhaps even just people that I don't recognize, but these were some folks I wanted to highlight. Uh, and those are, let's see, Anne Muov, uh, Carl F.J., uh, B.W. Shockley, uh, R.U. Dine, uh, Victor Wiz, uh, GWN Dan, uh, Andy Warburton. Uh, and again, those are names that I don't recognize, so perhaps newer or less frequent contributors. Thank you to all of them, as well as everybody else listed here who made contributions to CircuitPython uh, or the libraries or Blinka this week. Um, we had uh, 10 reviewers this week. Uh, looks like the usual suspects there. Uh, we had 37 closed issues by 12 people, with 23 issues opened by 14 people. Um, so that covers the overall stats. Next up, I will pass it over to Scott, uh, if you are available to tell us about the core. Totally. All right, so numbers for the core. We had 22 pull requests merged from 14 different authors. So thank you to all of our authors. I won't double thank uh, the new folks, but thank you. You know who you are. Uh, we had three reviewers, myself, Dan, and Jeff. So thank you to all our reviewers. We're also always looking for reviewers, uh, both for the core and more broadly. So if you want jump to jump into reviewing, uh, go ahead and raise your hand, and we'd love to level you up. Um, because the more reviewers we have, the more authors we can support. Uh, pull request-wise for the core, we have 18 open pull requests. Uh, uh, six of those look like they're more than 100 days old, so we should uh, take a look at those. Um, and kind of linear from there. Uh, as always, please take a look at any pull requests you're involved in. And close the ones uh, that are stale or don't have anything actionable, that sort of stuff. Uh, I think a number of these are also board specific, so if you do have a collection of dev boards, um, take a look at the PRs and see if you have any of the boards that are there. 
um, that can be super helpful too. Uh, issues wise for the core, we had 12 closed issues by five people and 13 opened by seven, so we're net up one. For a total of 555 open issues, I feel like there's a 555 timer joke in there somewhere. Um, we're slowly gaining, uh, generally uh, it's okay though. Uh, the way that we keep track of uh, kind of triaging our issues is through the milestone system. Uh, we currently have 54 open issues for the 8.0 milestone, which is a lot. Um, especially since we have gone through that. <laughs> uh, so that'll be our next thing. Um, but there, oh, <laughs> Mr. Certainly says there's always time for a 555 joke. Haha, <laughs> uh, good one. Um, and then we have 477 open long-term issues, which are the things that aren't super priority for us uh, who are paid by Adafruit to work on. Um, that's it for the core. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, no problem. Thanks. Next up, I will pass it over to Katni to tell us about the libraries. Tim. This section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, plus a few extras like our cookie cutter. We had 18 pull requests merged from seven different authors and nine different reviewers. Uh, the oldest pull request we merged was eight days old. Everything else was keeping up with uh, the latest uh, PR is coming in and leaves us with 22 open pull requests. In terms of issues, we have 25 closed issues by eight people and 10 opened by nine people, which is remarkable both because we are down quite a bit, but also because it was nine people that opened 10 issues. I'm really happy to see that many people involved, uh, leaving us with 658 open issues. 176 of those are good first issues. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including a list of the open pull requests and a list of all the open issues. If you're interested in contributing by reviewing, check out the open PRs. See if any of them uh, interest you. See if you have the hardware for any of them, test them. Uh, if you don't, just take a look at the code, see if it looks right to you and leave us a comment. Once you're comfortable with that, we'll consider upgrading you to the review team. Um, if you want to contribute code or documentation, check out the open issues. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. Um, we have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're also available on Discord uh, to help you out. We want to make sure you can contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we have two new libraries, Adafruit CircuitPython SI1145 and Adafruit CircuitPython AGS02MA. Uh, and a list of updated libraries, which I will not read off. In library news, we hit 300 Adafruit Circuit Python libraries, which the newsletter scooped me. I was hoping to scoop myself, but um, we have worked hard to reach this point. Um, we the overall number of libraries that's typically listed in the newsletter includes the community bundle, but this is a uh, this is an Adafruit specific uh, milestone. Um, so. You know, make sure that if you ever buy hardware, uh, check out and see if it's supported by CircuitPython. Um, you'll find libraries, uh, both, both drivers and helpers, uh, for most of, of what, we, what we sell and what we support. And that's where we are with the libraries. Alrighty, thank you, Katni. Um, and next up is the section on Blinka, and it looks like Maker Melissa is out today, so I will read the Blinka section. Uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers, as well as MicroPython devices. Uh, this week in Blinka stats, we had two pull requests merged by uh, one author and one reviewer. Um, so thank you to, uh, I'll say author again, uh, Anne Himov, uh, and then Melissa for the review. Uh, there are four remaining open pull requests. Um, there are 79 open issues. Uh, there were, uh, let's see, 8,563 Pi Wheels downloads uh, in the last month. And currently Blinka is supporting 89 different devices. Um, so that is fantastic. Uh, next up, we will start up our first of the two round robin sections. This will be the Hug Reports section. Uh, so Hug Reports, uh, just a reminder, this is a chance to highlight folks in the community and awesome things they've done. Um, I will start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. 
if you're text only uh, or missing the meeting but have hug reports um, in the notes document then i'll read them as uh, we get to your you know turn in the list um, and so with that i will get started so my hug reports this week thank you to uh, NearDoc for making a uh, and sharing a deep dive uh, octopus game graphic uh, the other day during uh, one of my streams definitely thought that was really cool so thank you for that um, to Deshipu, uh, who I noticed is working on PNG support uh, for Display.io, and I think that's definitely uh, going to be a really, really nice thing to have. So thank you, Deshipu. And uh, lastly, for me this week, thank you to Seagrover, who shared some uh, great seven-segment uh, font files that will be helpful in a project that I'm working on. So thank you to Seagrover. Uh, next up, uh, indeed, is Seagrover uh, as well. So uh, Seagrover is text only. I will read theirs. They have a hug report for me. Uh, thank you, Foamy Guy, for diagnosing some potential font issues uh, with bitmap label. That was this morning in the Help With channel. Um, so next up, I will pass it over to Dan uh, for your hug reports. Thank you. I also like to uh, uh, plus one on Deshipu's uh, working on PNG support. That's really great. It's sort of makes it all real because PNG is so universal. And thanks to Scott for uh, working on tuning up the web workflow um, before he goes on leave again. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next up is DJ Devin 3 who is text only. So I will read theirs. Uh, they have hug report for Toddbot and Neradoc for helping uh, to figure out uh, figure out my project was being limited by the spy bus speeds and that I needed to hack the Featherwing TFT for parallel mode. Uh, and then another hug report, thank you to Katni for adding an Osh Park Discord emoji uh, into the available emojis on Discord. So thank you uh, for that and thank you to DJ Devin3. Uh, next up, I will pass it over to Deshipu. <coughs> so thanks to Jeff and uh, Scott for the reviews last week and uh, group hack thank you excellent thank you to shipu uh, next up is hellweaver666 uh, who is text only so i will read a uh, big hug to everyone who helped me get up and running with my dev environment so i could make my first first contribution to circuit python uh, that's awesome congratulations on your first contribution and thank you for uh, leaving your notes in the meeting here um and then uh, let's see next up i will pass it over to jeff Hello, give me just a second here. Um, so yeah, first I wanted to give a hug to the QMK community for some discussions on their Discord this weekend. I went and hung out with them and said, you know, I wrote this uh, guide and I'd love your feedback because we love making guides better. And yeah, just uh, fun hanging out in that community. If you're interested in um, mechanical keyboards, custom keyboards, Definitely check that out. It's not CircuitPython, that's KMK, uh, but they're still a good group. Um, anyway, on to actual CircuitPython stuff. Thank you, Dan, for taking back the ESP32 bug with no PS RAM and making some interesting findings, particularly that the single core Unicore fixes it or conceals whatever the real problem is. And anyway, last up, a group hug for y'all, because I haven't left one of those in a while. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and let's see, next up, I will pass it over to Katni. Tim, first of all, I have a hug for the community and Adafruit for hitting 300 Adafruit CircuitPython libraries. Second, I have a hug for Tectric for jumping into changes um, to the libraries, uh, finding bugs, and getting them fixed up. A uh, hug for Lady Ada for writing the 300th Adafruit CircuitPython library, and a group hug. Excellent. Thanks, Katni. Uh, next up is Kmatch. Thanks, Tim. Uh, my hug goes to Jepler. Jeff, thanks for a PR to reserve PSRAM on the ESP32 builds. We'll likely simplify some code for the RGB dot clock displays. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for everybody else. Yeah, thank you, Kmatch. Uh, next up is Mark Gambler, who's lurking, so I'll read. A uh, special hug for my new uh, niece, Rory, as well as uh, Mark Gambler's brother and his wife as well, and a group hug for all of us. Uh, next up is Tammy Makes Things. So I just have a group hug today for everybody for being awesome. Excellent. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, next up is Scott. Hello. Um, 
Uh, hugs for me to Retired Wizard, Naradoc, PR Cutler, and Toddbot for testing the web workflow. Um, hugs to Andy Warburton, aka Hellweaver666, for the CSS improvements to the web workflow as well. And a hug report to Foamy Guy for the edit page, which I still have not tried, but is merged in, and I need to try it. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Uh, next up, and rounding out the hug report section, is Tectric, who's not present, so I'll read his. Um, hug report this week from Tetric for uh, Carter uh, for feedback on the SI1145 library. Uh, it's probably not 11, but 1145, I suppose. Uh, hug report for Lady Ada for tagging Tetric on new libraries. Uh, it's nice to see the cool stuff in the pipeline. Hug report for uh, Katni for constantly helping with whatever tasks I'm working on. Hug report for Foamy Guy, me, uh, for doing a game jam with CircuitPython. Uh, it's something, looks like Tetric finished uh, or, or stopped writing mid-thought, mid, mid -thought, so it just says it's something. Um, so we'll have to hear from Tetric maybe next week what the remainder of that thought was. Um, and then uh, lastly, Tetric did uh, leave a group hug for everyone. Uh, so thanks to Tetric, and thank you to everyone who participated in the hug report section. So next up, we will move on to status updates. Uh, status updates is our time to sync up on what we're doing. I will start and then we'll go through the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. Uh, when I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. Uh, this is also an opportunity to provide uh, tips and tricks to folks that are relevant to things that they're working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, then we can move it to the uh, in the weeds section to occur afterwards. Um, so I will get us going first. Uh, my status updates for this week, let's see, or I should say last week, uh, I pared down the uh, embedded web workflow uh, editing page to the most basic version with no uh, dependencies, so it can work uh, by itself without internet connection or any other libraries. Um, this past week, we had the official kickoff, uh, both the post and the video for the Hack Tablet giveaway. Um, the first couple of winners will be selected this week, so if you're interested in winning one of those uh, hack tablets, there is still a couple of days to get in uh, for the first drawing. Um, and then I also had, uh, this week I was working on, or last week I should say, working on the uh, Octopus game. Specifically, uh, I put in some high score functionality using both the SD card uh, and or, I should say, you know, either SD card or the uh, NVM storage. So uh, if you enable one of those two, the game will keep track of uh, the highest four scores uh, over the time that you play it and show them back to you. Um, also did a couple more of the guide pages for that last week and I'm hoping to wrap that one up this week, the guide for the uh, Octopus game. Um, this week, a couple other things that I'd like to get going are uh, starting the library for the hack tablet. Um, and then um, just a heads up to uh, people who watch the deep dives on Friday evenings. I'll be on vacation uh, this upcoming weekend, uh, including Friday, so I will not be doing a deep dive stream this week. So um, I will mention if uh, anyone else is interested, I think, um, you know, back early on, I started filling in for deep dives when Scott was taking days off. So uh, if anyone else is interested in streaming on Friday, I'm sure we could, um, you know, put a link in the Discord and all of that. I might actually be able to do it. I'll double check. Oh. Yeah, sounds good. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Uh, next up in the status updates, we've got uh, C. Grover, who's text only. Uh, C. Grover commenced work on the Clue Coffee Scale, uh, which is a NAU 7802ADC learn guide. Um, they wrapped up four project enclosures this week, uh, sawing, routing, thread tapping, and painting. Quite, quite a lot of work, it sounds like. Uh, the fingers are hoping for less than three Band-Aid experience. Um, and lastly, going back into the studio to track some new songs next week. Uh, so excellent. Thank you, C. Grover. Uh, next up, we will hear from Dan. Okay, a wider thing. Um, uh, we found that the builds were failing because um, GitHub was uh, deprecating... Um, Mac OS 10 builds. Uh, so uh, I updated that to 11. And then what they do is they do these brownout periods where when they're about to discontinue something, they turn it off temporarily so that your jobs will break temporarily and then you'll do something about it. And they do that several times to like make you pay attention. Um, 
then most of the time I've spent has been debugging uh, ESP32 builds with uh, PSRAM disabled, so that we have a P an ESP32 build with PSRAM. If we turn, if we disable PSRAM, it we get boot loops. Um, Jeff found that if you pretend that you have PSRAM, but you have a do auto detect, that works, but it sort of reserves the pin. I was trying to do it a different way so it wouldn't reserve the pin, and I found that I found out exactly where the problem is, uh, but it doesn't mean I know why it's happening, and only when both cores are in use, which is another clue. So we have various clues, and I'll spend a tiny bit more time on this, but I'll probably throw it back to um, Espressif soon and see if they can give me some hints about that. Uh, that's pretty much it. I guess I was also, I did some work on ESP32 SPI, like cleaning up some problems that people had and seeing whether it was our problem or their problem. So that I'll add that to the bullet list in a minute. Okay, that's it. Nice, thank you, Dan. Uh, next up, uh, we will send it over to Deshipu. Okay, let me... So, uh, I've, I've made a lot of progress with my robots. I'm working on a four-legged walking robot that's supposed to be super affordable and uh, super easy to build. Uh, so I have it working properly now. I have made a shield for it that you put uh, as a mask, basically, on, in front of it with a display that where you can display a face for it. So it can have emotions and, you know, <coughs> fun stuff. And uh, I also made a version of the same robot that uses OpenMV uh, board, which is MicroPython, not CircuitPython. But uh, it has a lot of uh, the vision algorithms implemented in it uh, directly. It has a camera built in. So you can do even more fun stuff with the robots this way. Uh, as as uh, people mentioned, I added uh, PNG support to the state library. I unfortunately I had to replace the GIF support because it wasn't uh, fitting on the on some of the boards anymore with both my boot. But uh, I don't know about any code that what you that that was using GIFs. So hopefully that won't break anything. And uh, going forward, I want to use PNG everywhere. Uh, I'm also adding the support to the fruit image load for PNG. I have a pull request up with the initial supports, which all should support indexed uh, images. Uh, but I still need to figure out how to undo the filters in PNG to, to support uh, other kinds of images. Indexed images don't use filters, so that was easy. Uh, other kinds of images uh, do use them, so I will. Uh, that that will be some extra code. And uh, yeah, and I also f f uh, finished with this sensor I mentioned last week, uh, but I still have to read the tutorial on how to start a new library for the circuit Python. I haven't done it since a while and, you know, learn to use cookie cutter and so on. So that's, uh, and that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dishipu. Yep, and definitely um, check out the cookie cutter guide. Luckily, they, uh, that process makes it nice and easy to spin up a new one. Um, next up, we will hear from Jeff. Hello again. So uh, both last week and this week, I'm doing stuff with the ESP32 family of microcontrollers and cameras. So uh, we are going to change it up and uh, rather than be based on the code that I primarily wrote myself, we're going to base it on Espressif's official library for cameras called ESP32 camera. And as of this morning, my one camera module that I have been testing works on the ESP32 S2. I can take a picture in RGB 565 or JPEG format. However, it needs to cooperate better with CircuitPython. Uh, one item that I'm aware of right now is uh, it needs to cooperate with the rest of CircuitPython when it allocates a PWM instance. It uses PWM to provide a clock to the camera module. And it also needs to have uh, kind of the a Pythonic API that we would expect. Um, there's a lot of getters and setters like uh, contrast 
And then we need to add things like a free choice of pins. Right now it's just hard coded to my one board that I'm testing on. Um, and I do have to make some changes within ESP32 camera. And I hope that at least some of them, Espressif would consider accepting upstream. Uh, one of them has to do with cooperating with other devices on an I squared C bus, which even their own um, dev kit requires, but they don't have it in the library. Um, and then last, uh, this is kind of a cross out. I will be chatting later today with Dan and Katni to discuss our CircuitPython day stream. So uh, yeah, that's on the books now, that's planned and it'll happen. So that's what I've got. Excellent, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and next up, we will hear from Katni. Hello. So last week, I finished up my list of Whippersnapper guide updates, created a power management template for the feather guides, filled one out, and then handed the rest over to Eva, uh, subsequently verified all the templates before they were deployed, uh, a few miscellaneous things, and set up some new libraries on Read the Docs. Uh, last Saturday, my Pi Ohio talk went live on Saturday morning, and that's now available on YouTube. This week, I'll be doing the PCF 9574 product guide, uh, verifying the current list of new power management templates that Eva finished since the last time I checked, uh, set up some new libraries on Read the Docs, and it is a short week again for me. In basement news, uh, patched the drywall mudding where needed, sanded all of it, found one more patch needed, um, redid a section of the plumbing where the well line enters the basement with PEX and installed a new iron filter. Started priming one coat, found out how much junk was in the water previously when we had to clean the aerators out of all the faucets. The basement fa faucet had one built in that has clearly never been touched. It was nasty. Uh, next up, sand the final patch, prime the rest of it with two coats, clean as much as possible, and then it's ready for the rest of August um, where we have uh, other things going on that needed this room. And then we will be continuing with uh, finishing things up, painting, putting up trim, all that in September. And that's where I'm at. Excellent. Thank you for the update, Katni. Next up, we will hear from Kmatch. This, this week, I uh, spent time visiting family, so not much CircuitPython uh, activity. Uh, but this week, hope to uh, get back to my bowling training aid uh, using an infrared time of flight sensor and figure out how to separate the pulse from the background noise and make some sense out of that. Hope to get that done this week. Awesome, thank you, Kmatch. Uh, next up, let's hear from Tammy Makes Things. Thanks, so last week I worked on debugging my matrix portal display status board that I'm trying to build to display the status from our CI CD system at work. Um, this week I'm hoping to finish that up and get it tested and release the code. Um, I hope to have some time to do some PR reviews and I'm thinking about what I want to do for uh, CircuitPython Day. And that's what I got. Excellent. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, next up, we will hear from Scott. Hello. Oh, OK, I have a laundry list of stuff. Uh, I made improvements to the C3 serial. It no longer drops uh, transmitted characters. It also enters the REPL quickly, um, which is awesome. Uh, turning on the Wi-Fi leaves USB active, which is a bug that we saw on the S3 as well. Um, so I had to fix the IDF for that. Um, I fixed WebSocket handling of frames that are over 125 bytes. Uh, retired wizard found this bug, and it was easy to fix. Um, I merged in web workflow responsiveness fix and changes to the title bar to, li to limit how often it was sent. Basically, to improve responsive responsiveness as I had had it, I was sending the title bar a bunch, so now it should send it less. Uh, I also merged in changing the web workflow port and dynamic reload of settings. So if you like save the .env, it should be able to go in and like change the port kind of as you do it. So you don't have to hit reset or anything. Um, working to enable the web workflow on the ESP32, and I'm adding a couple more boards, including the Odroid Go, which is pretty fun. Um, it's like a Game Boy esque sort of thing, which is neat. Um, this week, I'm fixing more bugs, including the fact that the title bar doesn't update enough, um, <laughs> which is unfortunate. And then I'm working with Antonio on adding File Glider web support, which is uh, on Android to start, which is really neat and interesting, uh, being able to talk to CircuitPython devices and discover them from an Android app, which is really neat. 
and then also working with Melissa on the code.circuitpython.org stuff. Uh, so that's it for me. And let me know if you have it, uh, any bugs and stuff, because I think I have three weeks uh, left before I'm on leave. Excellent. Great, uh, great stuff as usual. Thank you, Scott. Um, mm -hmm. well, lastly, for the status updates, I will read uh, Tectric's status updates. So last week, uh, Tectric did some final touch-ups uh, and test run of the pyproject.toml generation and switch over scripts. Uh, everything looks ready to go for next week. Um, next item, Tectric added the AGS02MA gas sensor to the Adafruit bundle as well as touched up the SI1145 library and submitted a PR for additional functionality to that library. Uh, this week, uh, Tectric's item says, on vacation all, uh, all over the Northeast United States, uh, so we'll resume next week. And that is the final status updates. So with that, we will move on to our fifth and final section uh, in the weeds. Uh, in the weeds, just as a reminder, is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These can either come out of status updates um, or be identified ahead of time. Uh, if you do have in the weeds topics and you haven't put them in the document already down at the bottom, please go ahead and do that while we read through the first couple. Um, so with that, our first item in the weeds is from DJ Devon 3 who is text only, and it says, let's see, Custom USO N8 to SOIC8 PCBs. Uh, USO Nuva chip arrived, which is a 15 millimeter adapter board for the Bluefruit Sense. Uh, to use this board, I need to add a PR for the Bluefruit Sense to allow 16 megabytes Cypress flash chip in ports board and NVM Toml. This tiny NVM adapter PCB allows a t allows the two megabyte, the, the ordinarily two megabyte Bluefruit Sense uh, to have 16 megabytes of flash instead. This will be DJ Devon's first build uh, contribution and they're taking baby steps for that. Um, so yeah, that sounds, that sounds really cool. So I guess, I'm not sure if there is a question. If so, maybe it's just like um, how to go about making that PR, it sounds like, to add it as what I would assume is a separate device. Um, kind of like the the Teensies are the uh, the device, or uh, no, not Teensy. Um, Trinket is it Trinket? I think the one that has the uh, Express version. This is kind of a bit of a similar idea to that, I think. Ah, status update. I see. I see that was a status update out of item. Yeah, no worries at all. Um, but that does sound really cool um, and super neat to be able to use that much space. Uh, that will certainly make it amongst the largest uh, devices that I'm aware of, at least. Um, so let's see, next up we have a uh, weeds topic from Tectric, who is not present for now, but this says the design guide recommends using Adafruit bus device where possible, uh, but what about Adafruit register? It uh, may make it harder for smaller boards to use, but it handles the abstraction of bit shifting and whatnot for code safety. How should relatively simple sensor libraries approach uh, using or not using the Adafruit register library? Um, and there are a couple of links here to some PR or APR, uh, which was the context for this discussion, as well as the uh, actual docs, uh, the design guide docs, which I assume are where it mentions what Tectric said, which was about using bus device. So it sounds like the idea is basically when to use a register versus when to use bus device uh, when you are writing a driver. Um, I mean, I'm I'm biased. <laughs> I'm biased in that I really like register the way that it abstracts stuff. There is definitely a tipping point where it will save memory. So imagine you have like two two drivers that both use it. You can actually share code then um, in memory, but it does have a bit more of a impact at the start. Um, it's a little bit more code to import, but generally I would use it if you could, but Okay, yeah, and I'm I can look at I can look at this thread and apply there too. I agree entirely Okay. So um, define when you say use it if you could What is Does that mean don't use it because there are boards out there that get memory errors when you try to import it 
So how do you define use it if you can? Well, it doesn't support um, SPI yet. So that's one. But I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think that's, the, that's the reference is more like what, what it doesn't do, not what it doesn't fit on. I guess what I'm saying, for example, yeah, another issue. Right, go ahead. I was going to say, in terms of can, it's just like if the model of the registers and the device match the model that the register library does. Uh, so is there literally an Adafruit CircuitPython device where writing import Adafruit register runs out of memory? It sounds like that's what you're saying, Carter. Yep. Yep, see the link. And it is, this has come up multiple times. And that, that one is typical. It's always a library that's like this, and it's on a non-express board, etc. And my quick look at the TMP117 data sheet, it's a very simple device. It looks to me like something that could easily be written without having to use the register library. And then it would work on that cutie pie. Yeah, I mean, I think there's other things to think, think about, right? Like, how maintainable is it to have bus device code scattered everywhere or I don't know I, I, I think it's easy to <laughs> yeah the TMP 177 Carter is the library's overdone in my opinion like you're saying it's a simple device but this driver is not simple it's not it's not registers fault it's the fact that the that the driver itself is complicated. Right, but that, that's that's the question, and that's kind of if we can if we can find something we can put into the design guide. Yeah. Then we have kind of an answer, and we can always just kind of like a bus device is an easy thing. That's there's like there's a no brainer that that should be used. Right. Register is a little more of a sliding scale. It's like it exists, it has benefits. There's pluses and minuses, and I don't think we have good guidance out there that kind of discusses the plus and minuses in a way where yeah. one can kind of decide when, when it should be employed or not employed. I think that's the wrong question. I think you should always use register, but you should not use it for every register of the device, right? Like you still, for, for an individual device, you have to use your discretion on what you implement and what you don't implement. And looking at the TMP example is just like, and do, do I, did I write this up at one point? It, it's the idea of like, are you reading the data sheet and wanting to expose everything? Or are, you, or are you taking examples and wanting to implement those examples, right? Like this is not a, the TMP example at least is not a problem of the register library. It's that this library was written to be very complete. Right. There's a lot of code in here that's not Adafruit register related that is in here that arguably doesn't need to be in here. Like, well, I, I think it's register related, at least to me it is. Like, for example, um, let's see. It's not, it's not the register library itself. Like, there's 150 lines of other stuff or 100 lines of other stuff. Like, convert to integer, this, these, all these enum style things. Like that, that's not a different registers problem. It sounds like in some cases, though, that before the oh, library oh. does anything, if you just import register on some devices, that you're already out of RAM. But I don't know. It sounds to me like in that case, there's just not enough RAM to really be able to interact with the thing. I'm not sure. Is there actually a case of that? I think that's what I understood from one of these threads. It was mentioned the cutie pie. This cutie pie one. Well, they're using the TMP one one seven. I think, I think this is a huge problem, but I don't think the answer is is hating on Adafruit register. I think really what we need is we need tooling that tells us how big our driver libraries are, like how how much RAM do you use at the end of this, because there's no feedback loop between driver writing and how much memory something takes. Um, at least there's no automated way that we do that. 
So, like, we're going to continue having memory allocation errors until we have a way of telling when we've bloated a library too much. Or, or when, like, people always come to us and say, like, add this functionality. And, like, we can say, yes, thank you, but that does impact how much memory it takes. And, and we have no way to measure that now. And we did over time. We have like Lamore saying in this thread, we have lost some heap space on the on the Sandy twenty ones over time too. It's not much. It's like three or four k, but that can make the difference between running out of memory and not. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to I'm happy to give specific guidance for individual drivers, but I would not blame Adafruit Register. Okay, so let's talk about the um, SI1145 pull request discussion. Okay. So I, I wrote the first pass at that library, and I would consider it to be a fairly simple um, sensor in terms of like its register layout. It's not a ton of registers, and they aren't really complex. So I lean toward kind of my, my thinking with register library is I will bring it in when things get kind of complex, which is it's, it's subjective. It's like I can't really... There's no definitive line of like, oh, when do things become complex? But if it's if the registers are just like all being accessed and written to eight, you know, full eight bits, like a byte goes out, a byte comes back, and you're just punching back and forth like that, I see register didn't really help out too much. You might as well just go ahead and just use bus device and call it good. Knowing that bringing in register is going to potentially bite you for the for the small boards like Cutie Pie. Well, I'm arguing that it, it won't like it. So I think one way to think about it is, is there are different ways of deduplicating code, right? Like if you have four registers that you're reading and writing, like either you can have a function where you pass in which of the four registers you're reading or writing, or you can have four copies of a class that is for, from the register thing, right? Like. They're, they're both serving the same function. They're both deduplicating the reading and writing code. Um, there's a little bit more overhead with Adafruit Register, but it also changes the model of how you're programming it, right? Where with Register, you can declare that these registers exist and then treat them as separate variables. Um, it's my belief that that is a clearer way to, to program and, and define these devices than you, by using a function to do it. Um, that is certainly not the way that Arduino does it, because Arduino can't do data descriptors, which is what registers is using. Um, so would you be willing to put that into the design guide? Because it sounds like you're saying register libraries should be used. Yeah, I'm happy to write something up. Do you think that it would help any, and this is a question for both of you, like for the real value of register is when you have bit fields, right? I mean, that makes it much easier to deal with those, okay? You right. can declare them. If there was I kind do. of a byte-only version of register for the simple, um, uh, the simple devices, and maybe there aren't any, maybe all of them have bit fields, I don't know, but it's like, so, so that if you imported some fraction of register that uh, like you didn't have to import all of register. Because there, there's a lot of, I looked at register once to see if I could make it smaller mm -hmm. and I couldn't really see any way to do that. Like, it's like, I was saying like, is there, like, is, the, is it, is there something about the byte millivision, the bit millivision code that could be refactored or something? I couldn't really find anything. You know, I didn't look for right. that long. But if there's, for simpler things, if there's some simpler way of doing register, and maybe I should have started at the top level to say, like, is there some way of writing a descriptor that ends up with less code or something? So that if there's some refactoring of register that could be done for these simple devices where all I'm reading is, like, two 8-bit values or something like that, right. and I still like to declare it, maybe, maybe register could be split into, like, byte and bit parts or something. I don't know. I thought we isn't, it already, isn't it already like that? Maybe it is. Okay. Because I, I, I don't write these drivers, so I don't know. I, don't, I haven't in a while either. 
But yeah, so I, if, you, if you look at the uh, TMP uh, 117 lines I linked, you can see where it's setting up the all of the registers using register library. And I think the ones like temperature and high limit and low limit and temperature offset right. are just like bytes. Yeah. Well, H is probably and two bytes. I mean, I also think you can save space. Just there's a lot of, a lot of uh, devices where they're they're really long names are used, unnecessarily long yes. names, and they're not underscored and that kind of thing. They're not constant. And yeah, and the, the, the SI is that. an example of that. Yeah. Like there's this SI one one four five command. Like that's a string that's stored in RAM. <laughs> right, like. I, th I think this is a tooling problem. It's a tooling problem around explaining why what takes space up in a particular driver and, and how code changes impact that. Uh, like there's a lot of this const stuff it makes it more confusing, but like yeah, you're I don't think register is a problem. I think there are other problems, not register. Which is why I would argue for using register where you can. Okay, I mean that's that's fine, but I guess puts when you write the um, the design guide stuff, it might be nice to have also some verbiage about how we're going to handle the low memory, um, the memory error issues for like QDP things, like the the issue for the TMP one one seven, and it's just, it could be as simple as like you need a bigger board. Well, I and know if that's it. So be it. I mean, this is the problem. Like, we don't need a bigger board. We need a smaller library. <laughs> Right, so somebody needs to go into this and do the like GC mem free tracking for like, okay, I imported it, here's how much memory I lost, and go in and figure out how to make it smaller. Like the TMP library certainly is too big, like larger than it needs to be. And same with this SI one, but like it, it we don't have good tooling around explaining why that is. Um, until we do, I don't feel like I can give guidance because we don't have the tools to, to guide that, that work. Um, uh, it's in, really just kind of a manual thing. In following that train of thought, is it, um, is it, does it give us meaningful information to import that library in CPython and gauge how much memory is used? Or is that information not really analogous? Like if we had a, an action or yeah. something. That um, did that on each, you know, on each PR or something, just output at a graph or a number somewhere. Yeah, that's the type of tooling I'm talking about. Um, C Python, I think, is too different to use for that. Okay. But that doesn't mean we couldn't do. I don't know. Can we? Is the Unix build? I think the Unix build is 64-bit. Um, yeah, and also like you couldn't import bus IO in it, so. If the if the code does that, then it wouldn't work. You would just get an import error. Uh, well, Blink. Uh, we could, isn't well. We could maybe maybe we could figure out how to get around that. Um, and you can do a 32-bit Unix build. It is possible. It's just not the default on modern 64-bit systems. Right. I guess I'm just worried that m measuring memory is going to be different if we're pointers are all twice as big. Like, we probably want to use the same object representation. So I've thought about this also is, like, we could actually use Q, like, do a QMU build, uh, where it's using QMU to emulate an ARM Cortex-M, um, and then importing a library and measuring, like, we could, we could capture the whole heap, and we could actually, like, do some cool visualizations around that, too, um, to explain how big things are. Um, that's the type of tooling I wish for. <laughs> Like I'd love, to, I'd love to be able to say like this. This library on import is 8k or 10k or 14k, or it was 12k and now it's 14k. Would it be expected that that number would be wildly different from device to device, like different ports essentially? Or if we made that measurement on an RP2040, is it pretty reasonable to assume it's basically going to be the same number on a ESP32 S2? Or does that need to be? I think it's. It's it's gonna be the same, basically, right? Like for scripts and stuff where you have fragmentation, like that's gonna be impacted by how big the heap is. So how many times like you run a garbage collect? 
and they yeah like like import imports will cause fragmentation too um but then the size of objects that you're left with is still going to be similar and mpy file size could be a, a reasonable proxy to start with as well like it does similar uh similar conversion stuff before writing out an mpy file it's just not quite true to what is in memory but it's an it's an approximation in terms of like I think like strings that get dropped because of the cons stuff gets dropped before MPYs are written out. Um, but yeah, this is this is something I'd love to do, and this is kind of I know it's frustrating that that the SAMD twenty one boards are not large enough, and it's just. It's really hard. A anybody who writes drivers should just use a, a SAMD21. <laughs> we could say that. Uh, it's not an easy problem. But strings, strings are everywhere, like, like Dan was, I think Dan pointed out. Like, in this SI example, like, all of these variables that are prefixed with SI1145, like, that string is, like, it's being stored for every variable. Like, all the variable names are stored. Um, and it could take a lot of space. So, it's a rabbit hole. Okay, so it uh, sounds like we have guidance then is kind of to try to use register if possible, and a new uh, a blurb in the design guide maybe will... Yeah, I'll take a look at... It's been a long time since I added anything to the design guide, so I could just do a read over of that. Yeah. Um, I think that'll be the main thing that helps up in the design guide, because then we could just simply, like like you could right now, if someone was using bus I.O. directly yeah. in a driver, it's very easy to say, please use bus device, link to design guide. Whereas right now with register, all we have mm -hmm. are kind of discussions and opinions. Right. I mean, this is a discussion. So, yeah, stop, stop, please, please update the design guide. I think that'll, that's great. Thank you. That'll help a lot. Yeah. I mean, this is a discussion that Tony and I had like early, early, early on, Carter. is like when I first did register, we had this debate. It's like if you, have, if you have three drivers that you're importing and they all do their own reading and writing of bytes, like that's duplicate code. Whereas if you had shared register stuff, then you could actually share it. Um, but you have to get more than one driver in memory first for that to pay off. Yeah, I think ultimately we, we need to have better tooling around library size. Um, especially as we develop drivers in, like, CPython. <laughs> like, CPython code is totally oblivious to how much, code, how much memory it takes. It sounds like we have at least a idea of a path forward on updating the design guide, and then yes. in some of these cases, the driver can be made smaller, uh, either with variable names or different different things. So there's some chance that could help it uh, be able to fit on some of those smaller devices. Okay. Um, uh, if if uh, nobody has anything else on that one, I'll read off our last uh, in the weeds topic. Okay. Or uh, I'll pass it over to Katni, I suppose, actually. Katni, if you want to read off yours. Yeah, no problem. So uh, just to follow up for Circuit Python Day, um, if you are interested in uh, contributing, participating, have any suggestions or ideas, uh, please email circuitpythonday at adafruit.com. It's the best way for me to keep track of things. Um, a lot of the events are coming together. I don't have a schedule sorted out yet. That's a plan for this week. Um, but we're still uh, open to ideas and, and so on. Um, so I just wanted to uh, plug that one more time. Awesome. Thanks, Katni. And that is our last In the Weeds topic. Let me find the wrap up here. Well, it's all for just a moment. There we are. Okay. Um, so, uh, this has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting again. This is for August the 1st, 2022. Thank you everyone who participated. Uh, if you do want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on the project, please consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. 
The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be made available on major podcast services. Um, the, uh, l this meeting will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Uh, visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. Um, the next meeting, um, I did not look at the calendar, I believe is uh, reg uh, scheduled regularly for the 8th of August. Um, yep. at 2 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, thank you for the confirmation on that. I appreciate it. Uh, so 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Next Monday, the 8th of August is the next meeting. Uh, the meeting is, of course, held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. Uh, if you would like to get notified about the meeting and any changes to the day or time, uh, please ask to be added to the CircuitPythonista's role on Discord. And that is all for today. So thank you again to everyone for participating, and we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.